Welcome back to the podcast. Just prior to the holiday season of 2022, I received an email from a man named Samuel Chong, who said that he'd like to come onto the podcast to talk about this book. He did not write the book. A French man named Michel Desmarquette wrote it. It's called The Theoba Prophecy. And Samuel is advocating for people to read this particular book. I said, okay, well, let me read it over the holidays and I'll get back to you and we'll do something after the new year. And it's a book about alien abduction. It's a book that purports to answer all the questions about alien abduction, uh, aliens intervening in human history, stories of the Bible and sort of the parallels with that. And like anything UFO or paranormal related on this show, I don't take any position one way or another. I entertain the subjects because I'm fascinated by these subjects. Uh, they're a very big part of who I am as a person and as a storyteller, and it makes sense for it to be a part of the show. Also, I am in no position to say whether something's real or not. A lot of people take this book to be science fiction. The author insists it actually happened to him. I'm going to go with the I'm going to assume the author has no reason to lie especially since the author's dead. <laughs> uh, Samuel, however, is a, a very passionate advocate for this book. And this show is largely about passion, usually passion for the arts. But if somebody comes to me and says, I'm really passionate about this book, the author's dead, but I really want people to read it. I want to talk to them. I want to talk to them, to the, to them about why. And since I do have a track record on this show of entertaining paranormal experiences, it makes sense that I would say yes to having this guest come on. And I'm very happy that he reached out to me because then we got to have this really brief but fun conversation about this book, The Theoba Prophecy by M Michelle Desmarquette. And so here's my conversation with Samuel, and I'll see you on the other side. How you doing? Very good. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for reaching out. Um, I read your book, or, or it's Michelle's book. Yeah, yeah. You read and, it? Uh, yeah. Yep. And uh, I have lots of questions. <laughs> and uh, what I'm, I, one of the things I'm primarily interested in, because this podcast is about passion, mm. and clearly you had developed a passion for this book when you read it, so much so that you went to Vietnam to sort of hunt for the author. So can you talk about finding this book for the first time, reading it, and going to find the author? I love that story, and I think we should start there. Well, you know, I always had a fascination on the mystery of the paranormal, and I thought if the ETs that have a different civilization can come and visit us, they must know all the answers, and we can just learn from them and to solve all the mysteries of Earth. So uh, in my subconscious mind, I always had this kind of fascination um, of uh, stories uh, from ET contactees. So when I came to the U.S., um, everything was available for me. So I searched on Amazon, and one day I found this book. Um, it was titled Abduction to the Ninth Planet at that time. It was selling very expensively at that time, so I checked it out from library uh, through their interlibrary loan services. After I read it, I was so shocked at this content because it really answered all my questions about the universe, the Bermuda Triangle, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, the stories in the Bible especially, and also the ET interventions in the ancient past as well as in modern history. Um, but in the postscript, it says there are more incredible things that the author, Michel de Marquet, was not allowed to write about because we were far from understanding them. That got me extremely curious because I thought the book is already incredible enough. What's more incredible about it? What's more that he cannot write? And what's more about the secret? So I decided to track him down. I searched on the internet. 
And I really was、uh, hoping that he would be still alive at that time, and he was. <laughs>、uh, he was living in Vietnam, and I didn't know his exact address. But I had a photo taken by a tourist who accidentally met him,、uh, a photo of his bungalow. So I print that picture out, and I showed it to the taxi driver after landed in Phu Quoc Island, Vietnam. And at the second try, the taxi driver took me there. I love that. You, all you had to do was show him a photo of the bungalow, and he knew where to take you. Because that's that just shows you how tight knit some of these communities are. If like if somebody were to say, "Hey, I know an author who lives in your hometown, Eric." This is what their house looks like. Now, I, I could probably take them to where that house is, even if I've never been there. Yeah,、uh, it is very very small community over there. And us actually being a French Australian,、um, a Caucasian in Vietnam, and、um, I mean, he was kind of a, a distinct character over there. Yeah. Well, when you when you first connected with him, he was plenty pissed that you found him, wasn't he? he yes, he was extremely、person. annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? What? So, how did that go? Well, it didn't go very well in the very beginning because he was refusing to answer all my questions because he thought my questions were very stupid. He asked me to read the books one more time, one more time, an additional time,、uh, which I didn't have time、uh, to to do so when I was in Vietnam. And I was trying to sneak in a few questions when he was distracted, like playing chess with me. And but he、uh, was、uh, very very careful about、uh, telling me all the secrets. But then the day before I was about to leave to depart, he showed me a contract. He signed with a Chinese publisher. He asked me if I could、uh, follow up with the Chinese publisher to see if、uh, his book got published or not. He got two thousand dollars the copyright fee royalty, but he never heard back from them anymore. I was so eager to、uh, please him, so I jumped at the opportunity, <laughs> and I followed up with the publisher. It turned out that、uh, because of the fear of the Chinese censorship, they decided not to have the book published,、uh, and he asked me to find another publisher. So. When he initially had it read, from what I understand from the postscript,、uh, there were people who assumed it was fiction, correct? Yes. And and they tried to give him feedback, like, "Oh, you should have more space space battles or something like that." <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the book doesn't have any antagonist,、uh, doesn't have any enemies to make it a Hollywood film,、um, so to speak.、Uh, but the book contains a lot of very interesting information, details that can be verified. So it doesn't really、uh, sound like a science fiction. I mean, it doesn't make it a good science fiction.、Um, But、uh, I mean, some people still see it as a science fiction book. Well, it's it's more of a. I read it more as a spiritual journey,、oh, which、yeah. there's some really great science fiction that doesn't have space battles that that are more of spiritual journeys. One one version of that would be Contact,、um, a great book. But、um, this is purported to be an event that actually transpired that he had. Uh, and that he wrote about. So we're going to presume that this is not science fiction, but in fact,、uh, somebody's actual account. Because I'm in no position to judge judge it otherwise. If he says it's true, we'll assume it's true.、Um, and this is something that I, I say to all my listeners because I get I do get a lot of strange emails like, "Do you do you believe this or that?" And I, and my contention is, I'm in no position to tell somebody that what experience they had wasn't real. Like I wasn't there, so I'm going to presume that it was real, because that's going to give us the best conversation that we can have. Great.、Uh, so、mm-hmm. let's talk about his experience, because it's 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 a very dense, loaded book. <laughs>、um, <laughs> we don't have to go into all the details, but、uh, what I want to do is is have you just kind of go into Michelle's experience. At the beginning of the story, and then we'll just kind of take it from there. Would you be willing to do that? Sure, sure. So it happened in June 1987 in Australia. In the middle of the night, he suddenly woke up. He didn't know why, but he walked to his backyard before.、Uh, but before he did that, he left a note to his wife saying that he would be gone for ten days. 
and there's absolutely no need to worry about, about him. And he walked to his backyard and he was lifted uh, to the middle of the air and he saw a very beautiful nine foot tall um, blonde ET extraterrestrial who led him into what we would call a parallel universe where he saw a lot of people wearing medieval clothes and a lot of savages. And he was told that uh, those people or beings were trapped in time in the parallel universe and actually explains a lot of uh, the mysteries surrounding the um, people who suddenly vanish in national parks in the U.S. and Canada, as documented by David Politis. It also explains the mysteries surrounding the missing planes and ships uh, when they um, went into the area near the Bermuda Triangle. So he was told that uh, this is a natural phenomenon, that uh, nearby ships and people and planes got sucked into this portal or warp. Um, and they have to know how to get out, otherwise they're going to be stuck there where time stops and where people don't feel any pain or hunger or thirst. And then um, he was told the reason of um, stopping the parallel universe was to prevent other people on Earth from seeing them. So they wanted to keep their mission a secret from other people on Earth at that time. So they went into their spaceship and he was disinfected. And they went on the journey for stopping on another planet called Arimo X3, where uh, it had um, a very interesting history that um, it had uh, advanced technologies and civilization, but they got into a war, a nuclear war about 150 years ago. Um, and then they collected some samples of, from the soil and, and also saw some humongous insects that uh, were posing a threat to the local people. Uh, and they killed the insects um, that were mutated from the irradiations. And then they went on their journey to uh, the planet Theoba. It's pronounced uh, Theoba, and some people pronounce it Jehovah, which is very similar to the word Jehovah. And there is indeed a connection there because yeah. the Theobans, Jehovans, were constantly monitoring our activities on Earth throughout history. Um, and the book further explains that the stories in the Bible, such as the destruction of the Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Moses leading the Hebrews out of Egypt and parting the Sea of Reeds, and uh, the birth of Jesus and, and the preachings of Christ, uh, and the resurrection of Christ um, were all their interventions. And they also intervened during World War II, in which uh, they prevented Germany from being the first country to develop the atomic bomb. They also collected the needles from Project Westford in the 1960s, uh, when the NASA wanted to improve the telecommunication signals uh, by sending hundreds of millions of copper needles into space. Um, it also explains uh, that why there's the tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingo village, Japan. As you can see, he learned a lot of knowledge and interesting facts that can actually be verified um, by modern research. Uh, but the book was written in 1989, where internet um, didn't exist in Australia at that time. So this uh, makes me wonder if um, he really had this kind of um, um, important mission of uh, passing messages from the ETs to us. And the purpose of the book is very interesting, is to wake us up because uh, we are living in a world of um, misinformation or influenced by the mainstream media. And it wants, to, uh, it wants us to really look at what's happening behind everything, behind the scenes, and to have more independent thinking and to realize the purpose of life. And it confirms reincarnation and confirms that uh, there's life after death. But the main purpose is to um, show us how to respond to life challenges. And um, I think uh, there is a very important message here. Um, and this is basically the story. And after nine days, he came back and, and he told the story to his uh, family members. His son believed him and his wife uh, didn't uh, to this day. And she thought he was having an affair with another woman. 
that caused him to divorce from his wife. Mm, yeah, sometimes it's really hard to convince the wife. And <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> um, we'll let that one go. Uh, so backtracking a little bit, we say that the, the, the Theobans, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. The Theobans. Uh, they, a lot of the biblical stories are purported to be interventions by the Theobans. So what would some of the reasonings be for them intervening with us? spiritual growth because whenever they become uh, concerned about uh, our spirituality development or spiritual development they um, wanted to correct our ways to inform us that we should focus more on the spiritual growth of our development not on the material wealth remember like i, I don't know if you know this but uh, the christian bible talks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as um, um, being um, like Sodom as the main cause. But the Hebrews, I mean, the um, the the Jewish Bible, I mean, the Jewish ancient scriptures, they describe in more details about why that happened. Because the people in the two cities were punishing the compassionate and loving people, people who were helping um, like uh, others, the poor, uh, and also the people in need. And they killed those people. They punished the, the people who were lending their hands. And this is really the main reason for the destruction of the two cities. And I found that to be very interesting because it's um, kind of, I really want to, I really want the kind-hearted, compassionate people to, to really, um, send their love to others and not to be punished. And I think this is a major concern to the ETs because um, they thought um, those people in the two cities were making a very bad example to the people who were in touch with them. It's like a cancer cell, like a malignant tumor. If you have a tumor um, in your body, would you want to keep the tumor or would you want to take it out? Well, this is exactly what the ETs did to the two uh, to the people in the two cities. I see. So that on that that brings up a whole bunch of questions that we don't need to get into. But um, what would be in following this rationale? What would be the purpose of uh, the story of Jesus, for example? Why would Jesus come to exist? Yeah, under the Roman control, the Hebrews were living in a very suppressed um, environment in which they couldn't really grow their spirituality. So that's why they decided to send Jesus and Christ to us um, to lead the Hebrews uh, to the right path. And also another reason why the Jewish people, the Hebrews, were the chosen people was that they actually came from a different planet called Hebra. That was a category three planet. We are living in a category one planet. Uh, it's the lowest category. And the Theobans, the Jehovans, um, come from a category nine planet, the highest category in the universe. Um, they didn't really want to see the Hebrews uh, being led into decay by the, the rest of uh, the people on Earth. So they decided to help them out by sending, by implanting an embryo in the uterus of Virgin Mary in order to fulfill the prophecy that someone extraordinary was going to be born. Um, and But because uh, Jesus was born that way, he really didn't know how to perform miracles because he had to pass through what they call the river of oblivion, forgetting all the knowledge that he accumulated in his past lives of performing all the miracles. So this is why in the Bible, there's no record of Jesus performing any miracle before the age of 28. Uh, or 30, um, even though he was highly spiritual and highly intelligent. Um, and he went to India. That's why some people say Jesus went to India and, and he died in Japan. So there's why there's a tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingovich, Japan. Uh, I think National Geographic has a story, has a doc, um, report on the uh, theoretical explanations why there is a tomb of Jesus Christ in Japan. 
Um, but I think this book gives a more plausible, more reasonable explanation. Um, Christ, on the other hand, is actually um, a theoban who took on the body of Jesus Christ made by the theobans uh, in order to fit into our earthly environment. And he preached all the things as recorded in the Bible just to uh, mainly show people that uh, universal love, um, unconditional love is important. And also there's life after death. That's why he, when he um, was nailed on the cross and then died, um, and then he resurrected three days after, that's just to show people that there's life after death and there is reincarnation. But somehow the concept of reincarnation was removed by the councils of the Catholic Church. And this book specifically mentions or named the four different Catholic council meetings that intentionally distorted the original meanings of the ancient scriptures in the Bible. And I find that to be very interesting because, um, you know, I read a lot of books supposedly written by ET contactees uh, a lot of them provide general information, like uh, information that uh, sometimes cannot be verified. But this book contains very specific information that we can look up and verify. And I find that to be very, very convincing because when someone tells you specific facts that can be verified, and I have to take the words very seriously. How long, how long was Michelle away? He was away for nine days. Nine days. All right, that's right. When there, there, there's an interesting part that um, I've been thinking about for the past week um, where he's given a pill. Well, he's given a couple pills or something like that where mm -hmm. like one of them removes any uh, anything that could harm the aliens. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is to force sort of an astral projection experience. I found yeah. that fascinating. Yes. And indeed that happened. And I see a lot of people um, who say that they have uh, out of body experiences. And I think there are some research is done by certain organizations and also including uh, the military as well. Um, so that's the way they disinfected him. And, and they also used, uh, interestingly enough, uh, different colors of light to disinfect him. First, a uh, yellow light and then blue light. I, I did some research. The yellow light increases the uh, speed of uh, metabolism. Uh, so it activates the different uh, viruses or bacteria by increasing the uh, blood flow in, the, in, the, in his body. And then they use the blue light to kill the bacteria and inactivate the viruses. Uh, there's a research done by Harvard Medical, Medical University that showed that there are about um, a few dozens of clinical experiments that proves that certain wavelengths of blue light have um, bacteria, antibacteria and antiviral effects. So can you talk about, um, there's this really, uh expansive history that it talks about where like humans were were brought to mars and earth they weren't they didn't realize that mars was already on its way out as a habitable planet um that humans were and maybe i was misreading the text but i guess humans were bigger originally but because of the gravitational forces on earth we ended up evolving to be smaller is this correct am i interpreting this correctly yes you okay. read it correctly um, that happened about 1.35 million years ago when black people and yellow people were coming to Earth from a different planet called Bakaratini because um, the planet Bakaratini was um, dying because its, cool, its core was cooling down. So I did some research on that. The book doesn't really explain it, but I did some research. When the core of a planet cools down, it doesn't have the electromagnetic forces anymore that can capture the atmosphere. So without atmosphere, and the people wouldn't be able to live on the planet. So they explored our solar system 
first they saw they visited Mars and indeed uh, there was life forms on Mars and back then and but um, it wasn't really enough to to really have them uh, brought bring their people over there um, so they explored Earth and then at that time there were no people on Earth there were apes and gorillas but no people. So they decided to land on Earth. The Blacks first landed in Australia, and the Yellow people first landed in what uh, today is Myanmar or Burma. Um, and because on the planet Bakratini, the gravitational force was uh, less than that is on Earth. So people were taller and, and kind of uh, heavier on that planet. But when they came to Earth, which has a, a stronger gravity, gravity and people over the years uh, became smaller and um, they actually had a lot of very interesting details uh, uh, like of survivals on earth uh, which i would strongly strongly suggest people to read the book to to get to know more information very interesting stories yeah i found the part interesting where like um the sh some of the ships were engulfed in earthquakes um it has it has a lot of answers to a lot of questions like like it'll explain this this alternate history that we were never taught and then it'll also like as you're reading it you'll, you you ha you immediately have these questions but then the paragraph after will answer those questions and i really that's kind of what i dug about it like it leaves you with questions as you're reading it but then if you just keep reading it you'll find those answers yes <laughs> Um, let's see here. Sorry. And some people, yeah. no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. And some people, after reading this book for the first time, they have a lot of questions. But when they read the second time, they find their answers, their questions to be answered um, when they read the second time. And then when they read the third time, their questions are answered. <laughs> More questions are answered. So yeah. this is why when I first uh, met Michel de Marquet, he kept saying to me, read the book, read the book in his uh, thick French accent. And so I was uh, really curious. Um, I mean, how this book can have so much information that answers everything. So before we go into, I, I want to talk about why he chose to publish it and all that. But before we do that, can we talk about the doko? What so the doko is this structure. It's huge. There's a, a very uh, modest illustration of it in the book where it, they're really these tiny ant looking people. And those are just humans against this large sort of egg shaped structure. What is this structure for? Well, the structure is where the people of the Uba, of the Uba live and they, they use it very efficiently. Um, so it causes no environmental pollution. When people go inside, they can see outside. So it's like um, transparent from the inside. But when people exit it, when they look back, they cannot see anything inside. So it gives people privacy, but at the same time uh, allows people to enjoy nature once they're inside. Um, so they use a special kind of force that can be found in human bodies. Um, we have uh, nine different bodies, a physical body, and which is flesh and bones. And we also have the astral body. We also have um, um, astral typical body. And each body emits a certain energy or certain force. And what the doko is that it uses one of the forces that our body emits um, and to make it uh, like uh, enlarge the force and make it stronger and to make it a doko. And some people ask why it's like a half egg shape. Um, because when some people who say they can see auras or see human energy field, they see that certain fields are in like a, um, like an egg shape. So I, I think that's probably the reason why the doko is um, like kind of egg shape. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of metaphor and allegory in there. Um, <clears throat> so, after nine days, Michelle comes back to Earth. What 
prompts him to write the book and to seek publishing for it? Well, he was instructed to write everything that he saw, he witnessed, and experienced. And his mission was to write a book uh, telling everyone what he actually experienced experienced in the nine days. Um, and then he had a hard time in the, in the very beginning. He had a hard time uh, finding a publisher to publish as a nonfiction. Uh, because everyone want, wanted to publish it, uh, wanted to publish as a science fiction. And he insisted not to have the book published as a science fiction. So after a few years, he finished writing the book in 1989. And, and he got the book published as a nonfiction in 1993. Um, and, and when he was um, with uh, the ETs, he was told that, um, he, he asked them, do, don't you know that after I write everything, after I finish my book, no one is going to believe me? And, uh, and the ETs responded, responded by saying that, oh, you don't have to worry about that. You just write a book. Just uh, remember the Bible in the very beginning, very few people believed in the Bible. But think about now, like how many people are influenced by the Bible. So this is the answer given by the ETs towards uh, his uh, um, like suspicion that no one's going to believe him. And so what drove him to find seclusion in Vietnam? Well, he had a lot of emotional issues, like a, a major depression after he learned that um, very few people believed him. Even the ufologists at that time in Australia didn't believe him because they were not consistent with their own, like the ufologist um, um, kind of agenda. Yeah. Um, and his wife um, didn't believe him. Um, she thought he was having an affair with another woman. So that caused his divorce. And a friend of him um, suggested that, why don't you change um, another environment than to live elsewhere? and go to Vietnam. Um, and so he followed the instruction from his friend and he decided to seclude himself in a very small, um, on a very small island in Vietnam. Now, there are, there are some things that he was instructed not to reveal in this book. Did he ever tell you what they were per personally? Yes, he did. Um, there are two things that he revealed publicly that's not in the book. Uh, there's one thing he revealed personally to me that he was not allowed to talk about to anyone else. Uh, the two things he revealed publicly were that um, there are three chambers beneath the Sphinx of Egypt. That when we are ready, when the three chambers are open, everything will be known. Um, and the second thing is uh, regarding the graves. Um, he says that uh, the graves have been monitoring us just to see how we respond to our increasingly decreased immune system because the grids also have the same problem um, because they're a dying race. They want to see how we respond to the same challenge they have been facing. Uh, they're also from a category one planet, uh, even though they had better technologies. And they indeed um, had about 150 people um, having implants by them just so that they can monitor, monitor the people. Um, but there's absolutely no harm um, caused by the implants um, because the Theobans were actually monitoring their activities as well and also protecting us, making sure that there is no damage caused. And the one thing he didn't reveal publicly um, concerns um, a very interesting information that I'm privileged to obtain after meeting him for the second time. He told me not to reveal it publicly to anyone because he said Tao, the main ET, his contact, um, said to him that way. But what he didn't say was that, um, he didn't say I couldn't write an article uh, <laughs> revealing as many clues as possible so to make it a puzzle. Uh, for everyone to to get a sense of what that is about. So that's why I wrote an article and I posted it on my website 
so people if they're interested they can they can read the article and get a sense i'll the put a link to article, it in the show notes okay <laughs> and the title of the article is uh, uh, the second coming of christ okay gotcha yeah okay. but they'll get to it um well i enjoyed this i'm glad you reached out to me i i think that uh these kinds of stories are fascinating for me like i said before um I just take it as Michelle experienced it. And is Michelle still with us today? No, he passed away about passed. four years ago. Oh, that's too bad. Um, and so the book lives on through you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have this uh, life purpose, the passion, the mission to spread the messages in the book. I don't have any financial interest in the book, but I just want to spread the messages because in the last three years, we all know what happened. I want to wake people up. Yeah. That's great. I love that level of passion. And I am I am interested in more of the details of the grays because uh, so much of the UFO experiences we have on this show concern the grays interactions with humans. And uh, when you talk about the, the dying sort of, um, the, their dying race, uh, or their inability for their bodies to cope. Uh, what 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 does what does that mean in terms of human biology? Like, what's going on with humans that they're interested in? Are we losing our ability to for our bodies to defend themselves against the environment? Yes, according to the message that was sent to Michel de Marquet telepathically, we have been losing our immune system since nineteen forty eight. Uh, the Greeks also have the same problem. They want to study us, how we respond to such situation. Um, they're also from the planet of Soros, and so are we. Um, and, but I, you know, I have a friend uh, who is a very beautiful Chinese lady who works at a major luxury store, and she had a very interesting encounter with the Greeks a, a few months ago. Um, she hiked in Yosemite National Park, and she got injured. After he came, after she came home, um, she saw this um, like two or three grays visiting her, and um, and then the next day her injuries uh, were fully recovered. Um, she also saw like it felt a little bit of um, unease in the very beginning because she. You know, she is a very beautiful lady, and she thinks uh, the the grays are really ugly. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't. Know. But but she had an implant too. And, but there's no harm, and she she was really lucky after she encountered the grays. I mean, everything she wished came true. In the sense, she was uh, suspecting that the grays were helping her to achieve her her goals or dreams. Um, so it confirms that there's absolutely no harm, absolutely no harm caused by the grays. Great. Uh, thanks again. And I'll make sure to email you once I've scheduled this for release. It'll probably be the latter half of February. Okay. And uh, we'll go from there. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. day. You too. Bye-bye. And that was my conversation with Samuel. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, when I go into these conversations, I always go in with the presumption that the author of a work genuinely believes they went through an experience. And so I'm not critical of them in the conversation or when approaching the conversation. However, I do have thoughts on each work that I read. And I, sometimes I'll talk about them on the podcast, sometimes I won't. With this particular book, I did find some of the explanations of human history on Earth to be a little bit racist. Um, you know, I don't care about the, the part where, you know, we came in on spaceships. Like, that's such a common explanation uh, in certain UFO circles for why humans exist on Earth. Completely... Uh, obliterating evolution and all that. <laughs> there are people who believe that. Um, I don't personally. I love the idea. I think it's it's kind of romantic in a science fiction way. But um, the explanation in this book for it came off as a wee bit racist. For example, the, the wording of yellow people landing in Myanmar <laughs> and black people landing in Australia. Um, 
the, the racism alarms were just going off as I was reading it. But there are aspects of the book that are entertaining and interesting and get you thinking. And in the end, if you can just say, okay, well, this is that, some of those other things turn out to be interesting. And as a science fiction author, I'm always interested in what other people are writing, whether it's fiction or purported to be nonfiction. And so if you're a science fiction author, if you're into the alien abduction phenomenon, maybe this book is for you. But just keep in mind that uh, it's really dense and it's loaded with a lot of information, so much so that it can be really confusing. Um, much like the Bible, which I'm a big critic of. <laughs> uh, it's so much information that you are easily steered into confusion, which, yeah, that's it. That's my warning, but also, if it's your speed, it's your speed. There's apparently a big fan base for this book, and Sam is one of them. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I actually did. I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad that he reached out to me. Thank you, Sam. I hope you are willing to come on again and that I treated you fairly. Bye.